Hello, this is Debbie Kay with the League of Women Voters of Portland, and you are watching Video Voters Guide. We're here with the support of Metro East Community Media to talk with candidates running in the May 2020 primary election. With me today is William Miller, running for state representative from District 50. Welcome, William. Thank you, Debbie. It's great to be with you today. Thank you for coming. Please tell us a little about yourself and why you are running for this office. Yeah, you know, growing up as a, a little kid, I was always fascinated with policy and governance. Um, I often say that, that my desire for policy and service was born out of me getting in trouble as a child. Uh, as a little kid, we lived with my aunt and we always were put on the timeout bench. And when I was in timeout, I would have to watch CNN. Uh, and at first I thought it was uh, torture, but I grew to, to pay attention to what was actually happening. Uh, and at six, seven years old, I would ask her really tough questions about what was happening internationally and domestically, uh, which, which bore my passion for service and governance. Beyond that, um, I have deep lived in personal experience. Uh, growing up, my family lived paycheck to paycheck, barely making ends meet. Um, I grew up in the, the K through 12 education system. Um, and, and, you know, in, in 2006, my father died of an opioid overdose, um, which was very tragic. But then going into 2007, my brother was murdered over a drug deal. Um, so, so all of those things really fueled my fire, so to speak, to want to make sure that we were providing good service to those who need it most in Oregon. Um, I currently have two siblings who are addicted to drugs, and so seeing the barriers and the challenges in which they face on a day-to-day -day basis, I want to make sure that we're providing unique opportunity for those throughout Oregon. Um, so, so beyond my, my lived experience, um, my, my professional experience, I studied political science in college. Uh, after college, I worked for State Representative Tana Sanchez of House District 43 and then went on to represent the Native American Youth and Family Center and Hacienda CDC during the 2019 legislative session, uh, passing meaningful policies, uh, which really have impacted all Oregonians and people who call Oregon home. Um, and I want to continue that. I want to continue to be a champion for those who are most vulnerable in Oregon, those most underrepresented. Um, and as a gay man and a Native American man, uh, I would be the first ever Native American man elected to the Oregon legislature if the voters vote me in next uh, next month and in November. Uh, so this is history. This is history in the making. Uh, and I want to make sure that, that Salem is reflective, uh, the leadership is reflective of the constituents uh, in the district. So that's why I'm running and that's why I'm excited about this opportunity. Well, thank you for that introduction. What do you see as the challenges currently and that will be created by the pandemic? And what, how will those challenges um, affect effective and efficient government uh, in the state of Oregon? And what would you do to meet those challenges? Yeah, you know, I, I currently serve as the advocacy manager at the Native American Youth and Family Center located in Portland, uh, overseeing policy and systems change locally and statewide. Um, and we've, we've shifted our focus current, you know, given this pandemic, to really continue to meet the needs of our community and uplift those most vulnerable. Um, so I have, I've been on the ground witnessing this time and time again, but the, the most critical needs I think currently are access to basic rights um, and, and ways of living. So, you know, a stable place to call home, food, uh, keeping your lights on, the basic tenets of what it means to survive. I see time and time again, our community struggling on a daily basis, um, given that they're out of work, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so I see that currently and thinking ahead, you know, we need to make sure we're fostering a, a system and a state where each and every person has the ability to thrive and not just survive. You know, I think right now everyone's sort of in this survival mode, um, but we need to make sure that everyone has uh, equal pay for equal work, um, equitable opportunity for, for housing and opportunities um, that otherwise might not be afforded to folks. Um, but we need to also make sure we're holding our corporate partners accountable in this process uh, and making sure that they pay their fair share so that our community has the resources necessary and the funding to thrive. So I think that 
you know, while I see, while we see this, this, these issues in the current pandemic, I think we'll keep seeing these issues long after it's over because it will continue to be felt for a long time. And it, it's going to take some bold leadership um, at the local, statewide, and even the federal level to make sure that each and every Oregonian has the resources to prosper out of this. Thank you. Yeah. Traditionally, the legislature has conducted the decennial redistricting process, which will occur next year in 2021. Are you comfortable with the current redistricting process? And if not, how would you change it? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that Oregon's redistricting process, it started years ago, I believe in about 2017, uh, is when I first started hearing about it and the folks joining the table for those discussions. Uh, but I, I firmly believe that Oregon's current redistricting process is on a good path. Um, I want to make sure we're carrying equity, racial equity, socioeconomic status, those sorts of things in, into play. So we're not creating a divide when we're redistricting, that we're creating an equitable process for the best representation possible for the folks in which, which live in those districts. Um, and I currently see that. I see that, that the state of Oregon is on a good path in making sure that, that folks are represented uh, to the best way possible. So I, I, I don't know if I have any changes today. Uh, I guess we'll see as those, you know, the process goes on. But um, I think I want to continue to center uh, equity and making sure it's an equitable, equitable process, um, free from gerrymandering, because we know how that can, that can really shake and, and, and shift a um, representation at the, at the statewide level. Right. We have a little over a minute left and two questions to go. So I'm going to counsel you to be brief if you can. Yep. What are your thoughts on cap and trade proposals intended to mitigate climate change? Are they a good idea or not and why? It's a good idea. Uh, we have to start somewhere. Uh, if we're not protecting the climate, there's no other issue that's most important. But also in that process, we need to protect jobs um, and, ec and good economic paying jobs. So yes, I support it, but I also want to make sure people have the means necessary to thrive. Thank you. And last question. What is your view of the suggestion that the legislature suspend collecting the taxes that to fund the 2019 Student Success Act? No, we shouldn't. We shouldn't suspend it. Um, our, our youth and our teachers and our educational system, it's long overdue. This investment is needed. The investment is now. Um, we need to make sure we're fostering uh, that opportunity to, to for the next generation of leaders, uh, doctors, engineers, uh, and these dollars will allow us to do that. So I think that we need to continue those investments. You did it, thank you. Yes. <laughs> this has been Video Voters Guide. The primary election is Tuesday, May 19th. Please be an informed voter. You can visit www.411.org to learn more about the candidates and ballot measures on your ballot. And please exercise your right to vote. Thank you for watching.